Welcome to the Health and Safety Podcast. My name is Michael Wong. I'm the founder and executive director of the Physician Patient Alliance for Health and Safety. We're talking today about implementing monitoring with capnography. This clinical education podcast is made possible by an unrestricted grant from Medtronic. We are pleased to have as our guest Barbara MacArthur. Barbara is an advanced practice nurse at Sunnybrook Hill Sciences Center in Toronto, Canada. For the listeners who might not be familiar with you or Sunnybrook, and particularly I'm thinking here of our U.S. audience, could you please give us a brief background? Sure. Thank you, Michael. As you mentioned, uh, I am an advanced practice nurse at Sunnybrook uh, Health Sciences Center. Um, It's a large trauma academic center, and we're one of the largest centers in Canada. Uh, My background began in the operating room, and I've spent about 25 years in the OR working closely with surgeons and anesthetists. I then covered other ambulatory areas, such as the endoscopy and cystoscopy clinics, um, as well as medical imaging. And I've now been practicing in medical imaging for the past four years. Uh, In this area, I I provide practice support for procedural areas, such as interventional radiology and ultrasound. Thank you for sharing your work work experience. What a rich uh, nursing experience you've had. We are all aware of the standard practice of monitoring in the operating room but these practices occur less frequently outside the OR. Does uh, Sunnybrook continuously monitor patients receiving sedation outside the OR? Um, Yes, we do. uh, So what prompted Sunnybrook to choose capnography monitoring? Well, there were, um, we're in the process of updating our, our hospital policies, and what came across our table was um, a working group to update the procedural sedation policy. Um, that required us to go back and look in the literature and um, review the current literature. Um, and we decided that the evidence was um, there to include uh, entitled CO2 monitoring in our policy. Um, we, we left it as a recommendation um, because not all units have the hardware um, currently on the units and we didn't want to sort of set them up for a failure. It's recommended so that when they do buy new hardware, it would be um, obtained so that they could incorporate this into their practice. So what exactly in your literature view convince you that capnography monitoring would be better for patient care than, say, pulse oximetry or other patient monitoring devices? Um, Well, when we reviewed the literature, uh, we came across a few position statements. Um, The Association of Radiology and Imaging Nurses, ARIN, um, published a position statement based on the evidence that uh, has shown that capnography has a clear superiority in evaluating the patient's ventilatory status. Um, when it's compared to just the current routine monitoring practices. This is shown to result in safer patient care. Also, uh, the American Anesthesiology Society practice guideline uh, that was released uh, for sedation and analgesia given by the non-anesthesiologist, they also strongly agree that early detection of hypoxemia through the use of um, oximetry during sedation analgesia decreases the likelihood of adverse outcomes, such as cardiac arrest and death. Um, they therefore recommend that n CO2 be used in situations where direct ventilation cannot be directly observed. Also, the AORN, um, Association of Operating Room Nurses, put out a guideline for the care of the patient receiving moderate sedation and analgesia that provide guidance uh, based on the quality evidence, and they also recommend that n CO2 be used to monitor uh, patients when ventilation cannot be directly observed during procedures. Well, these are great uh, recommendations. Thank you so much for pointing out these uh, societies and uh, on our uh, podcast, we'll make sure that there are links provided to uh, those uh, recommendations and guidelines. In your experience, have you found capnography to provide a reliable early indicator of patient decline? It, it does. It does because it actually is uh, real time. Um, with the pulse oximetry, there is a delay which could be up to a minute in healthy patients. So there, that's a significant sort of uh, re- time that um, is delayed that reaction could um, happen. And certainly in patient decline, as you point out, uh, minutes count and the early indicator is going to be 
uh, the best uh, best for uh, patient care and patient safety. So thanks for pointing exactly. that out. Um, exactly. As an OR nurse, you're familiar with continuous patient monitoring in the OR. Uh, why do you think it's important to include patient monitoring during conscious sedation? Well, in my area, we don't have anesthesiologists administering the sedation. Uh, we have nurses giving it, um, so we have to be more diligent. Um, we know sedation is a continuum. It's not finite, so patients can easily slip from uh, moderate levels into deep levels very quickly. So I think having the monitor can let you know the patient's status sooner. For example, if they're getting into a respiratory problem, um, the nurses can intervene much quicker. It, it almost sounds like then the equipment becomes your eyes and ears, in a sense, yeah, on the patient when you're uh, unable That's to... Exactly right. Uh, I've also implemented it in our MRI scanner uh, because staff are the patients alone in the scanner in the vet unit. Um, so, and some patients require sedation. So nurses now can monitor the the, the waveforms um, and see um, right away if there's any um, ventilation ventilation issues. As you point out, even with lightly sedated patients, there is a danger the patient may slip into deep sedation and tragically respiratory compromise, insufficiency, or even death. In your practice, there are, are there certain procedures that you have found are more risky or certain patients that are more at risk for respiratory compromise? For sure, we do an assessment on our patients um, and obviously look at the comorbidities, um, patients with COPD. Um, we do an, a pre-anesthesia assessment and to and provide an ASA score to determine if it's acceptable for a nurse to be providing sedation uh, without an anesthetist. So the more comorbidities, the riskier it is, we will um, not provide that without anesthesia as present. Implementing any new technology may necessitate changes in policies and procedures. Have you had to make changes to policies and procedures at uh, Sunnybrook Health? As I mentioned, we have um, updated our current um, procedural sedation based on the current um, evidence. Um, so did you have sorry. concerns about alarm fatigue? I know in my discussions with nurses, they have often expressed concerns about increasing the frequency of nuisance alarms when introducing additional patient monitoring devices. Uh, did you have any, any of these concerns or how did you uh, get over these concerns? So we're fortunate at our, our facility here at Sunnybrook. We have a policy for physiological monitoring and alarm management. So the staff here um, are instructed to reassess alarm limits to match every patient's uh, most recent baseline. So individual parameters are set at the beginning of procedures. This this, by doing this, this reduces the amount of false alarms and alarm fatigue, so staff can react appropriately to alarms when they actually happen. Excellent. So it's not just a matter of um, making sure the monitoring is, is uh, attached to the patient. It, it's uh, a matter of also going in and, and in, individualizing the, the monitor to the patient's condition. Exactly. Since implementing capnography, have nurses at Sunderbrook found uh, capnography monitoring valuable in the in the care of their patients? Um, yes, the nurses have embraced this. Um, though we didn't have many um, adverse reactions to begin with, but um, my nurses, I've received feedback that they have seen the waveforms start to change. Um, they've gone over, assessed the patient, and had to do like a chin lift or rouse the patient. So there is some positive feedback coming. So since uh, monitoring with capnography, have you seen uh, any reduction in adverse events such as transfers to the, to the ICU, length of stay, or decreased use of Nar Narcan? Um, I'm not aware of any patients uh, receiving reversal um, or any escalation of care with a rapid response team uh, since we've implemented. Um, going forward, I'd like to examine um, this and do a retrospective examination of both the influence uh, that capnography has on our ad adverse events here since we've implemented it before and after. What do you think are the biggest challenges to implementing capnography at a healthcare facility? 
Well, I think some of the big challenges uh, would be the costs associated with it. Um, times when healthcare facilities are trying to cut costs, it's really hard to justify implementing something that's going to add to the cost. But when I look back at some of uh, the older studies, there was once a time where there was literature arguing the fact that pulse oximetry for procedural sedation was um, was necessary. Um, but now I feel this is the next step, which um, providers need to be aware of the current evidence that's out there. And capnography, time and again, has proven to be a safer way to monitor our patients. So any last words of advice you might give to nursing leaders looking to make the case to improve safety in their own facility? I think clinicians must continually improve patient care um, based on the current evidence and make smart decisions where it'll most benefit. In my experience, I'm not putting capnography everywhere. I'm choosing where it will have the most effect and starting from there. Um, and that's going to prove to be a benefit. Um, and then um, potentially expanding it to other areas where it could also benefit. What areas, if I could ask, uh, might you be looking at? Other areas we're looking at would be in the endoscopy area. Um, also, I'm, I'm looking in the post-anesthetic area. Mm -hmm. um, some patients are very sleepy, and um, it may be potentially worthwhile looking into that area for benefit. Excellent. In conclusion, I guess with lightly sedated patients, monitoring may not bring as many uh, benefits, but it's the moderate to deep sedation patients, as you point out, that are going through procedural sedation that might require uh, capnography monitoring. Exactly. Yeah, th thank you so much, Barbara, for joining me on this podcast, and hopefully clinicians and nurses out there will listen to this and, and implement capnography in their own facilities. My pleasure. Thank you, Michael. This clinical education podcast is made possible by an unrestricted grant from Medtronic.